welcome to BizTech's Technology Show, the show where we feature technology companies across Asia talking about their solutions and how they make a difference to their customers' businesses. Today, we, we speak to James McHugh, the Regional Director, Asia Pacific at Universal Robots. Universal Robots develops and sells collaborative robots. Now, welcome to the show, James. Thank you very much, Brian. Excited to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Now, James, let's start off by you giving us an overview of Universal Robots and its history. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Universal Robots is a Danish company. It was founded in 2005 by three guys at the University of Southern Denmark. Um, and they had a view that uh, you know, they wanted to empower people through robotics. Um, and that meant shifting from robots uh, that are inherently unsafe to developing robots that can work safely alongside humans, that were easy to program and that would allow small to medium businesses initially um, to unleash the power of automation and be able to compete with, uh, with larger organisations. Um, and, you know, over the past 16 years, we've sold more than 50,000 cobots around the world. Uh, you know, so I guess we had the benefit of probably having more experience um, of deploying cobots in small, medium, and even multinational corporations um, in, throughout Asia and around the world. Uh, and we continue on a, on a, on a, on a, on a pretty amazing uh, journey of growth, supported by the customers um, who use our robots, who really are the hero in this story. Okay, James, give us a, before we dive deeper into the conversation, give us a primer on the difference between a robot, a cobot, and a universal robot. Sure. Look, uh, industrial robots, I think most people can, can envisage an industrial robot. They normally sit behind cages. They move very, very fast. Uh, they are, you know, very much associated with, uh, you know, the production line within an automotive factory or electronics or even food palletization. And they're incredibly, you know, they've, they've done incredible things to reduce the cost of manufacturing. The thing with these, the industrial robots, are they are almost done. Um, blind to their program. So if, if, the, if the robot's program says move one metre to the, to the left, if anything is in that robot's way, then the robot's got a pretty good chance of being able to cause that, that object harm. So in most cases you find industrial robots always some form of either physical, almost always physical, or um, electronic safety barrier to prevent anything living getting between that robot and what its program is telling it to do. As a result, these robots can be inflexible, uh, difficult to program, uh, which, and they're very, they, the, the automation that surrounds them and the safety systems that surround them are very, very expensive. Um, collaborative robots are used in, in, in factories, but typically they move more slowly. They have safety systems inbuilt so that if they collide with a human, they can actually stop before any, any harm is caused. So they have, they're inherently safe or Category 3 safe. Uh, they don't require shielding or, or caging. Uh, they don't require light sensors or light curtains. And uh, the other unique thing on top of the safety is that they're incredibly easy to program and, in, and, and they, they provide manufacturers with enormous flexibility because they can literally be put on a trolley or unbolted and moved to a new application. And in most cases, uh, what we see across Asia is actually it's the actual robot operators, whether it was a welder, the, your best welder teaching a robot how to do a monotonous weld, and it's all done through moving the robot through the path of that weld, as opposed to having to type code. Okay, and, and, and which brings me to the point of, of the traditional uh, view of an industrial robot of, of making things quicker, faster, quicker, and more accurately. Mm -hmm. How is that now taken to a different level? Because obviously the cobots are a lot smarter and therefore a lot more flexible as well. Give us a sense of how your key customers deploy your products. I mean, uh, the majority of our robots to date have been, you know, deployed in applications such as um, inspection, quality inspection, you know, in, a, in an automotive plant that could be checking the gaps between panels, very, very common that our robot would be used to do that, um, all the way through to, you know, 
small component manufacturer to uh, ensure that the quality is where it needs to be. Um, another, another common use of the robot is to pick and place components in and out of uh, CNC machines or, or um, 3D printing and then remove the finished product and put it on a path to the next, the next stage of production. Uh, very commonly used in palletization or pick and place systems for secondary or primary or secondary packaging. Uh, so they're the kind of common applications that the robot, robot sees. Um, other interesting ones, I think an amazing project was done in Singapore was um, for uh, commercial, um, commercial strawberry farming, where the robot's actually been used to take a photo of the, uh, of the, of the flower and uh, actually determine the appropriate amount of uh, wind speed to pollinate that flower for maximum production and minimum waste. You know, which is an incredible application that 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 that, that customer Simbro um, delivered in Singapore. Really, really quite unique, and, and and actually driven by the pandemic. That's incredible, and I want to talk about the pandemic because that's changed the way people look at manufacturing because of several factors. One, of course, availability of labor. Two, also all the supply chain disruptions are forcing a rethink. Could you give us a perspective of? how the manufacturing industry has been impacted and how you've been able to help them. Yeah, look, I think every, every, every country has had to deal with uh, labour shortages in the manufacturing segment. You know, now historically in, in markets like Singapore, it's because low cost labour was, was, was migrant labour and with borders closed, that's not available. Uh, in the case of other countries like Australia uh, or Japan or, or Korea, as an example, you um, you can't attract people to manufacturing jobs anymore. It's it's almost not cool, right? So and so, as the pandemic has taught everybody that the notion that strategic sourcing was to get rid of all, your entire production capacity and outsource it, there's been a race to rapidly reshore and do so at lowest possible cost, and that's meant that people are looking at automation very differently. Um, today and they want to see automation that's flexible and that can be deployed at varying scales so that the small to medium guys can compete with the large guys who are largely now offshored and been subject to either component shortages or very, very significant, significant increases in uh, freight, as an example. Okay, so, and, and I'm just going to take your example and, and, and put an example together and, and you tell me whether this is right. <laughs> U.S. manufacturer outsourced production to China and then because of this now realized that it may be cheaper for them to reshore some of the production back into the U.S. because logistically it's cheaper overall to then supply their customers within the U.S. because the manufacturing is done in the U.S. despite the higher per unit cost uh, perhaps in terms of manufacturing. Is, is that the sort of scenario yeah, that we're talking well, about? Well, that's, that's certainly one scenario I think you need to look at that, that as long as you, I think what, what a lot of people don't realise is that a lot of production that was sent to China was done on the basis of low cost. That's not necessarily always the case. There are very highly automated production um, product, producing nation. There's, 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 there, yes, there's still some elements of, of, of low cost labour, but the majority of, of Chinese High, 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 high standard production is already, you know, incredibly high, high level automated. So when you stand back and go, well, what am I actually buying then? Because it, because at the end of the day, power costs around the world are roughly the same. If you've got a stable power grid, um, you know, you can produce products using a good balance of skilled, talented labour and a good balance of, of, of um, industrial automation, which cobots are part and produce closer to point of use or point of consumption um, and do so where you're in control of, you know, so much more than, than, than what people have found they have been during this pandemic. Now, James, on the other side of the equation, if I'm the worker, I'm reading all these doomsday scenarios about a huge fear that millions of jobs globally are going to be lost as a result of automation from the adoption of Industry 4.0 and now early industry 5.0. What are your thoughts on this? Look, I think you know, it's natural that, that, that people would, would fear you know, automation and robotics because that's what they've seen. 
They've seen car, car plants go from employing hundreds of thousands of people to very few people. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the cobotic revolution is, is somewhat linked to this industrial robot deployment through the, through the 80s and 90s um, and, and through the 2000s. We actually see the power of collaborative robots is taking humans from working like robots to taking humans to working with robots. Our cobots can't do things without talented production workers to show them how to do the dull, the dangerous, the dirty, the monotonous. So when you think about this, and I think welding is a fantastic example, or sanding or polishing, there's an inherent amount of skill to that. Um, but there's also a lot of monotony in some, some of it as well. Now, if you can take your most talented welder, and let me tell you, you can't find welders in many, many markets around the world. Yeah, if you try to get in the aircraft industry a titanium welder, good. Yeah, welder. but imagine the fact that your best ti titanium welder could actually show his cobot buddy, the, the cobot that effectively works for him, how to do the monotonous straight welds by actually holding the robot and welding and it learning how to do that exact weld from the best from your best welder. But the power to then allow that incredibly talented welder to do the things robots cobots can't do. They're not great at the, they, they can't think on their feet. They're not they're, they're not creative. But what they can do is learn to do the, the monotonous and, and then all of a sudden you've got a talent, your best welder making sure that all of the standard welds are at his quality standard. So higher production outputs, less, um, less failures or, 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 or escapes, and better outcomes for, for, for customers and, and manufacturers. So I think that's the, the, the point is the cobot needs people. And, you know, I, I, I was talking to, I was, it was a case study that came out of Japan recently, and uh, it's an automotive component manufacturer, aren't they? Um, compete with a lot of the big guys. So, the, you know, Malaysia is a good example. You know, like where, 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 where Proton Motors produce cars, the biggest employer is Proton. And the small guys simply can't compete with, with, with you know, conditions and the like in that segment. Well, a lot of those supply chain companies, you know, the, the automotive supply chain supplying there can use their reduced staff and cobots to continue providing product to um, these tier one automotive manufacturers or electronics manufacturers. And I think the exciting thing when you see this happen is that these operators from these manufacturing companies are the ones teaching the cobots how to do the job at the highest standard they know how to do it. And, and I, so I actually think we're over the course of cobot deployment, upskilling. And you know, we now see people who might have once been CNC machine operators. They're now running five, six, seven CNC machines that are all managed by cobots. So they've moved from being a CNC operator to a robotic cell manager. And I think that that's, that's attracting people back into manufacturing and actually helping manufacturers stay competitive on a global scale. And, and James, you are based in Singapore. I'm going to use it. And the Singapore government is starting to relook to see whether or not they can attract more manufacturing jobs to Singapore, mm -hmm. one of the quick wins that they recently had was to attract Shimano to actually set up a manufacturing plant in Singapore. Now, awesome. this is a classic example of then without automation, it would never happen. You're actually yes. creating new jobs in Singapore that ordinarily Singapore could not uh, could not attract. You know, in the last twenty years, Singapore uh, Shimano is traditionally been in markets like Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where, in fact, the net effect could be, in fact, cobots helping to create jobs. Well, look, I mean, the World Economic Forum sort of suggests that, you know, that robotics deployment will create, you know, 58 million jobs in the next five years. You know, so certainly, you know, from, a, from, a, from our company's view, we understand the fear that we, we, we never created cobots or commercialised cobots to do anything other than empower people. And that today to us means stopping people working like robots and getting them to work with robots. And our robot can't do it by itself. And, and I think that's quite unique in, 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 in industrial automation. James, 
Now, you, you have an Asia-Pacific remit. That's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. What are the key trends that you see in Asia in terms of the adoption of automation? I think the, the, the pandemic has made people very conscious that they need to be able to, to, to have sovereign capability and they need to do so at the best possible cost. So all of a sudden, people are looking into what, how can we do this? And uh, increasingly, you know, we're seeing cobots being used side by side with humans because they also can provide a, an effective method of social distancing, right? Um, and allowing factories to automate in their current footprint, which is unique, right? Normally, to put in a new automated industrial robotic line, you either start with a new factory or you have to close your current one. And while it's refitted, that costs money. Cobots, on the other hand, can be rolled into factories um, and almost deployed immediately. I think one of my, my favourite examples is, uh, you know, automotive manufacturer. We took the cobot to their um, to their lunchroom in its two boxes. Within an hour, the uh, engineers had it out of the box on its stand and they were program programming it. Two hours later, they were walking the factory floor looking for ways to deploy it. You know, and within and within within about four hours, there were, there were more than twenty five um, projects they believed they could use, and that that was not not really with any of our people being involved. This was the actual operators who work in that factory, know it the best, going, "Wow, this could help us improve quality, improve safety, and reduce the cost of poor quality." And traditionally, James, what's the ROI that an organisation can expect on the uh, cobalt investment? It's a good question. Because our ROI varies, you know, due to the cost of labour in each region. You know, so what we try and explain is, you know, the cobots should have, depending on how often they're used, you know, I'd hope, you know, five, six years of life if they're, if they're working, you know, two, three shifts. Um, so one would expect that, you know, we've, we could have an ROI somewhere between six and 18 months, depending on what your cost base is. And depending on upon how how willing people are to look at the cost of, you know, their real costs of, of labour, which is retention, training, cost of cost of mistakes, um, absenteeism, which I think is going to be a huge challenge um, as we continue to understand what this new normal looks like, right? For us that can work from home, it's not such a big issue, but factories depend on people and people depend on factories. So... <laughs> I think that cobots really do allow people to come back to full production, whatever it's electronics or, or um, uh, food production uh, and, 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 of course, the automotive segment. And, and, and to me, whilst the, the, the end users are often looking at it from a financial perspective, um, the real challenge is that they can't get enough talented labour to work in manufacturing locations, generally speaking. James, uh, I've got to ask you for a checklist. If I'm a CEO, me and my team have realized that, okay, we're too traditional. We have so many problems with labor. Mm -hmm. We really need to think about automation. And let, let's use an example maybe of a country in Malaysia, which relies, manufacturing relies a lot on foreign workers. Mm -hmm. What is a checklist that we should go through uh, in order to set our implementation goals and, and set ourselves right in terms of automation? Well, I think the first thing that you need to do is involve your people. So involve, involve your, your you know, cell managers, operators, and ask them how could this be done better, done quickly, and what would that free you up to do? I think it's very key that you would get that involvement early. Um, look at the applications that don't require, you know, creativity, um, human ingenuity that are dull, monotonous, um, and, and say, okay, let's find the top 10 applications that really your skill level shouldn't be, shouldn't be wasted upon. Then, you know, work with, 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 with one of our partners to, you know, simple, to, to deploy a cobot on a, on a proof of concept you know, quickly, and effectively and evaluate what your up, uplift is in productivity and reduced um, quality or the cost of poor quality, um, not to mention the fact that the given, the given assurances of the cobot's inherent safety 
um, in terms of not hurting any of your workers and so on and so forth and make and make the robot operators the hero here you know make sure that they understand that this can't work without them and that way you get the best possible outcome for for, 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 for the robot employer right so james i think from from your advice i, I have two key takeaways immediately one involve your people do make sure and, and people on the shop floor, not just the engineers. Yes. And two, also make sure that there's some sort of proof of concept, because I think a lot of companies uh, implement solutions without first doing a proof of concept on a very small scale to identify the quick wins, as you also uh, yeah. have done. I mean, I, and I, and I, you know, in my experience, in our experience, Normally, the factory operators and, and their, their supervisors know how things could be made more efficient, but they're not empowered to do it. And this is where you know, working with one of our partners to unlock those opportunities one at a time, right? And that's the real power of, of you know, collaborative robotics is it's actually been, the automation is being done by your people for their benefit. And, you know, as time goes on, confidence builds, processes from the robotic perspective continue to be optimised. And then, of course, they say, well, that one's really optimised now. What's the next opportunity that we can deploy a cobot to? James, it's been a fascinating conversation. But before we end, would you like to leave us with some final uh, nuggets of wisdom? I, I just think as we all come out of this pandemic together, there is a, a unique place for cobotic automation and it needs to be deployed for the, you know, these, these hero customers of ours are doing this to preserve jobs, stay, stay uh, profitable and keep their people safe. And I think that whilst there's fear that robots will replace people, I think the opportunities that will come from cobotic deployment as we emerge from this pandemic will far outweigh any, 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 any concerns that, um, that people may naturally have. James, thank you very much for coming on Vistex Technology Show. Thanks so much, Brian. Take care. We've been speaking to James McHugh, Regional Director, Asia Pacific at Universal Robots. I'm Brian Fernandez. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.vistex.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you.